So I'm going to share a couple of things with you this morning, and I have probably got 20 minutes. 35 minutes, is that okay? 30 minutes? Yeah, cool, 20, 25 minutes. And um, I just wanted, I felt in coming here, I just really felt like God wanted me to encourage you, um, encourage you to press into knowing who He is. I know that sounds like the simplest thing ever. Like, yeah, we know who God is. But the reality is when we begin to understand who He is and how much He loves us and His pursuit of you, His passion for you, everything changes in our lives. It radically, radically changes and it's altered forever. And that is my personal experience. Um, when I was, I grew up in, a, in, an, in an unchurched home, a home that knew nothing about God, celebrated nothing about God. The only time that we went to church was if someone had died and we needed to be there or, <laughs> or someone was getting married and we had been invited, you know, those kinds of things. I just never grew up in a Christian home at all, had no grid for that, no context for what that meant. And I found myself at the age of 18 trying to commit suicide. And I had a tough relationship with my dad. My dad was um, what I would call a half-functioning alcoholic. So he didn't touch alcohol from Monday to Thursday. But then from Friday all weekend, he would drink. And it would get crazy in my home. Sometimes there were punch-ups and all kinds of things. And, and so I just had this, this struggle with my dad. Anyway, when I was 18, I tried to commit suicide. And I woke up in a hospital room. And I lay in this room there. And I was just, oh, man, I was broken. And I was alive, which was a problem. And I remember just laying in that bed, angry and frustrated and weeping. And I heard a voice. I heard a voice deep within my heart. And it just said, Wes, if you give me your life, I'll put it back together again. And in that moment, I didn't know who that was. But looking back in Hansen, I realized that was the very first time I heard my father's voice. He just tugged at my heart. And within a couple of weeks, I, a friend had invited me to church. And I, I wasn't very excited to go, but ended up going, and I got born again and gave my heart to Jesus, and everything began to change. But it changed not because I had bought into a self-help program, not because I had signed up for a class on how to be better. You know, the gospel doesn't make bad people good. It doesn't do that. It makes dead people alive. And I was dead, dead in my sin, dead in my brokenness. And there in that hospital room, I met my father for the very first time. And so this relationship began with the Lord. And, uh, and I got involved in church and all kinds of things happened. And years later, I ended up being in the ministry, being a pastor, uh, doing what I do. Uh, but God was continuing to unravel my heart and, and introduce me to himself as a good dad, as a loving father, as a generous father. To understand his, his passionate love, his relentless love towards me, even though I didn't deserve it. <laughs> you know, I often say to the people that I lead, I say, man, if we'd had a vote and you had to choose who your pastor was <laughs> and you knew everything about me, you wouldn't have picked me. I would not have been your choice. <laughs> guaranteed for the rest of you, you would not have picked me off the list of, to preach Sunday, you know, if you knew who I was. But God saw something in me because of his love for me, because of his passion for me. So one day, a few years ago, God radically shook my heart and my mind and my understanding of what love is and how he loves us. I was standing in um, a local supermarket and I was checking out. I had bought a couple of things, not a lot of things. I think I'd gotten bread and milk or something like that. And I was standing at the checkout and in front of me were two young guys. And uh, the one guy had a backpack on, and he was kind of standing um, on the other side of the till, and his buddy was putting some food through. And as I was standing there, the Lord said, Wes, I want you to pay for their food. I was like, oh, now you just, okay, quickly have a look what's there, see if you can afford it. Ooh, okay. And it was, you know, it was, it was manageable. So I leaned over and I said to these two guys, I said, hey, can, can you do me a favor? I really feel like I should pay for your groceries. Can I do that? And they kind of looked at me, you know, and I just said to the lady, I'll just put it through and, and I'll, and I started kind of putting my stuff through and I'll just pay for it. And they were like, wow, okay, thank you. And uh, so, you know, you, you're kind of thinking, what is this all about? So I reached for one of those, like, Jesus loves you kind of moments, you know, I just kind of do that, you know. And, um, and so they grabbed their things and they were kind of put my stuff through. The, the teller was putting my stuff through and they walked off. They got about, about three or four paces away from, from where we were. And all of a sudden, two or three guys just came out of nowhere and arrested them. The security, the shop security just arrested them. And I was like, <laughs> I kind of got a little shocked and looked over at them and kind of looked up at the heavens and thought, oh my gosh, I've, God's just made me an accessory to a crime. Like, what's going on here? You know, well, what are you doing? You know? And, uh, and so these guys immediately got arrested and, you know, the guy with the rucksack on his back was taken off and it was open and it was full of stuff that they'd just shoplifted. And I kind of stood there for a moment and I felt like the Lord immediately speak to my heart and say, where's, go and tell them. 
and the Lord like, kind of put something in my heart. So I walked over to this young man who has now kind of been arrested. His buddy was being, had been accosted by two guys over there. And I looked at this young guy, and he's kind of, his, his head was hung low. And I kind of asked him to look me in the face. And I looked at him, I said, you know what? I said, I believe in Jesus. And God told me to pay for your groceries. And he wants you to know today that if you will trust him, he'll take care of you. And you won't have to live like this. And this young man just hung his head, you know, in shame. And they kind of, that's all the opportunity I got. And they got whisked off. And I went back and thought, let me, let me pay for my stuff. And I uh, kind of paid for my groceries. And I was leaving. I was like, well, what was that about? You know, part of what God's put in my life is a prophetic gift. that I just thought, I thought, well, why didn't you just tell me that they were stealing? You know, I could have ta- turned to them and said, thus says the Lord, repenteth thou thief. Stop stealing, you know. Like, they're one of those things. God, why didn't you give me that word for them, you know? Why did you let them go through? And, and then they get arrested. And I felt like the Lord say, where's, this is the reality. All of you are broken and all of you are trapped. It's all a mess. I'm not trying to call you out for your sin. I'm trying to awaken you to my love. You see, God's love paid for us, hey. He paid for the grocery. He took the bill. Jesus died on the cross for you and I. His life was poured out as a ransom for you and I. God didn't ask us to pay for our mess. And you know what? He doesn't hold it against you. He put it to Jesus' account. And in that moment, I realized, you know what? My sin is not his problem. That's been dealt with. The issue is, am I willing to trust him as a good dad? Am I willing to be led by him? Am I willing to just lay everything aside, surrender all that I am and say, okay, dad, I'm going to trust you. You're this good. You know, when God sent Jesus, um, he sent Jesus into a world where they, they spoke, when the Bible was written, pardon me, when the Bible was written, it was written in a time in the world where they spoke in Greek. That was kind of the language of the day. A little bit like English, hey? I suppose English is like the language of the day. If you want anything important, you'd write it in English. At least that's what we think, hey? Yeah. And, uh, and so they used this Greek language, Koine Greek. And there's this word agape. And if you listen to preachers, they'll tell you, oh, agape is the God kind of love. You know, that's what it means. But actually, in the original Greek language, it's not a God kind of love at all. It just means the highest form of a moral love. And what God did, what the Bible does in using that word agape, that word agape is redefined. Love is redefined, and it's redefined according to the standard of Jesus. So Jesus comes into the world, and he begins to redefine what love looks like. Love doesn't make a demand on us. Love comes to supply. Love comes to wrap us in his arms. Love us, rescue us. That's the heart of the Father. And there's so many of us as Christians walking around this world, and all that we're thinking is about our sin. God, oh man, I better get this right and get that right. And and we fail to live in this place where God has forgiven me, and he's drawn me to himself so that I can walk with him and love him and be loved by him. And in that place, something new, something glorious, something wonderful begins to take place. In fact, the truest definition of who I am comes alive in that place, the love of a father. Yeah? I want you to go, if you've got your Bibles, go with me quickly to the book of Exodus, Exodus 34. Try and give some context very quickly. <laughs> this is a portion of scripture where Moses, where Moses has been instructed to take another set of stone tablets up the mountain so that God can give the Israelites the Ten Commandments. Because what had happened is he came down off the mountain after 40 days and he had run into a bit of chaos. The Israelites and Aaron, the high priest, who would be the high priest, they got all uh, gold, some gold together and they fashioned for themselves a golden calf to worship, an idol to worship. In fact, the Bible says they called it Yahweh. They gave it the name for God. Hey, the the God that was on the mountain, they made an image of him down here. And uh, it caused a lot of problems. And uh, it was a bad day for the Israelites. And 3,000 people were killed, all kinds of things. But anyway, the content of this story is that God instructs Moses, Moses, I want you to come back up the mountain. And then in this portion of Scripture, God actually gives... um, an example of himself. He, he kind of describes himself to Moses, and in doing that, he describes himself to us. And I want you to hear God's definition of who he is to us and how he wants us to relate to him. L- listen to what it says here in Exodus 34, verse 6. It says, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord. He's going, It's me, Moses. It's me. This is who I am. He says, The compassionate and gracious God slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Isn't that beautiful? 
Isn't that absolutely amazing? God says, I'm going to tell you, Moses, who I am. This is who I am, Moses. I'm compassionate and gracious. I'm slow to anger. Oh, wow. You know, when we think of our Father in heaven, what do you think of? What is the first thing, the thought, first thought, pardon me, that comes to your mind when you think about God? <laughs> when you run into trouble or you're in trouble or you cause trouble, what is the first thing you think about God? You know, de the devil has made it his life's ambition to twist and pervert our understanding of the Father. And in doing that, he's driven us away from God. Not God away from us, us away from God. It's an amazing picture in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve sin. They are removed out of the garden, not because God is angry and wants to throw them out. You know that? He puts them out of the garden so that they don't eat of the tree of life or, or the tree of, of life and live forever in their sin. That's what the Bible teaches us. So God, in fact, says, I'm going to give them death because it's going to be merciful because it means I can die for them and change the whole thing. But the picture in Genesis is that as they move out of the garden, they move a little more east. <laughs> and then the Bible says they, they do something and then they move a little more east. And then they move a little more east. And it's a picture of us moving away from God. And it's what the enemy does is he distorts the image of who the Father is and we just find ourselves moving a little bit away from the Father. And then we move a little bit more away from the Father. And then we move a little further away from the Father. And eventually they ended up in a place called Babylon. And what did they do there? They tried to build a tower to do what? To reach the heavens. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves understanding the Father in ways that are not true. And we end up doing things that are messed up and broken and don't bring us into fellowship with Him. Rather they bring a scattering of our lives. And I want to tell you, friend, the greatest thing you can do for your, in your relationship with the Father is get to know Him. Get to know His love for you, His purpose, His intention. He's slow to anger. Like, you can't make Him upset. <laughs> He's good. In 1 Timothy 1.11, it says this. It says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So, uh, so Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. That word blessed in the Greek is the word makurios. And it means happy. It means happy. I think that portion of Scripture should be translated more like this. That according to the glorious gospel of the happy God, which was committed to my trust. You see, you have a happy father. You have a happy father who is so in love with you and sees more in you than you see in yourself. He's more delighted in you. He cherishes you more than you could ever understand. And so what the enemy does is he makes us believe the opposite of that. And what do we do? We start building towers east of God. And we move away from him ever so slightly. What that looks like in a church context is you might start out from the front row <laughs> and something goes a little east in your life or something gets a little out of kilter and you move a row back and you move a row back. No indictment on those in the back row. <laughs> Bad analogy, right? <laughs> but you end up in the back row and then after that you kind of end up at the door and we separate ourselves from God and His people all because we've misunderstood something about who He is. He's a happy, faithful, generous, loving God who invites us to know him intimately. I've got a few more minutes. I'm going to try and, try and run through a couple of stories here just quickly to make a point. So you know the story of the prodigal son, right, in Luke 15? And the story of the prodigal son essentially is about a dad, a good dad, a really wealthy dad, the kind of dad we all want. And this dad has two sons, right? And he has an older son and a younger son. And the younger son, he, he just goes, man, I don't want to work on this farm anymore. I don't want to be kept in this house anymore. I, I need to break loose a little bit. I need to kind of experience life a little bit. And he asks his dad for his inheritance. And essentially, in the ancient Near, uh, ancient Near East, that, in that culture, you only got an inheritance when your dad died. So he was saying, oh, you know, Dad, I'd appreciate it if you were dead. <laughs> Could I have, Could I have what's, what's mine? And he takes that gift. And the father says, wow, yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't mind giving you your inheritance. And if he goes... And the thing is, we don't have a dead father, hey? So he takes his inheritance and off he goes and he squanders it, the Bible says. He just kind of wastes and he wastes it on all kind of prodigal living, the Bible says. Actually, anyway, let's not get into that wrong, wrong word there, hey? But he goes and squanders all that he has and then he ends up in a pigsty, in an absolute mess. And in the Jewish culture, that is a euphemism for being as far away east as you can get from God. Like, the furthest east you can get in the Jewish mindset was a pigsty. Like you couldn't get further away from God in that place. And so he's, he's in the pigsty. But the Bible says in the pigsty, he comes to his senses. He goes, whoa, 
I need to go home. And he doesn't have a revelation of, woo, God, you know, my father's, he's a good man. He's a just man. He's faithful. He's, he has a revelation of this. My dad will give me something to eat. My father's all kinds of things, but what he is good is, I know that he is, is that he's good. And the servants in his house are eating better than me. I'm going to go home. And so he makes his way home. He comes to his senses and he goes back to his father. And the Bible tells us in Luke 15, 20, the father is waiting for, for the son and he sees him from afar and he has compassion. His heart is filled with this extravagant, relentless love for his son. This over-the-top, extravagant, wasteful love for his son. And the Bible says he runs out to meet his son. He has compassion on him, which is love. He loves the son and he runs out to him. And the Bible says he falls on him, embraces him, and kisses him. Now, I love that word kiss in the Greek. In the Greek, it's not a, it's not that kind of kiss. It is relentless kissing. It is lots of kissing. It's the way I kiss my children. That's probably how I'm going to kiss them when I get them at the airport. I'm just going to grab them and go, as a parent, you've done that, hey? You've smothered them with kisses, like, oh, get away, get away. You know, it's that kind of kiss. It's this falling on and embracing and loving and accepting. And the very next thing that happens in verse 21 is the son begins to repent. He's like, I'm so sorry. I've done all these kinds of things. And, oh, and he starts to repent. But then the father doesn't go, yes, my boy, well, you should have repented. You've done all these things and we'll, we'll fix this up. And the money you wasted. No, no, that's not what happens. The father immediately shuts him down and calls to the servants and said, bring me a robe and a ring and shoes and, and find the fattest calf we have. We are going to celebrate see, when you run into the Father and you run into His love, you know what happens in our hearts? We immediately want to repent. <laughs> you want to change your life? Don't try and be better. Let Him love you. <laughs> you want to stop sinning? You want to break the, the bad habitual habits of sin in your life? You want to have a better attitude? You want to serve God more rightly? Let Him love you. Get into a place where His extravagant, over-the-top, relentless love will invade your heart and life to the point where you go, oh man, I don't want to do that anymore. And you know what His response to you will be? won't be, you're right, you better shape up. His response will be to restore your identity. Because when the son came home, he was not looking like the son of this father. He was looking like he had spent the last while as far east as you can go. And the father's response to his sin, the father's response to his brokenness is to give him a new identity, to restore to him sonship. We find this truth all through scripture. Jesus comes and he comes to the earth and he comes and represents the father completely. I'll, I'll end with this story because otherwise we're going to run out of time. You finish at quarter past, hey? Yeah. So, so Jesus comes to the earth and he, and he runs into an adulterous woman. Well, he doesn't run into her. She's brought to him. You know the story? John 8, this lady is caught in the act of adultery, the very act of adultery, and she's grabbed by these men and she's dragged through the streets, probably in the most humiliating fashion. If they were this aggressive and this horrible, they probably didn't give her time to dress. And they dragged her through the streets of Jerusalem and they found Jesus at the temple and they threw her down at his feet. And they didn't care about her life. They were trying to catch Jesus. That's what they really were trying to do. And they said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, come on. The Lord Moses says that there's only one way we should deal with this woman. And that we should stone her, we should put her to death. And Jesus, confronted with her situation, he says, okay, I hear you. Those amongst you who have no sin, go ahead. You take the first shot. You throw the first stone. And the Bible says one by one, they put down their stones and they leave. And then Jesus has an encounter with this lady. And he looks at her and he says to her, where are your accusers? Where are those that were baying for your death? Where are those who want to destroy your life? Where are they? Where are your accusers? You know, the, the word there, accuser, in the Greek, it's actually taken from an Aramaic word. And the Aramaic word is the Hebraic, comes from the Hebraic word for Satan. The idea of the devil in the Old Testament is that he is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that stands, or at least tries to stand before the Father and accuse you. 
hey God, you're so righteous. Surely you should put this person to death. Surely you should take them out. They, they can't be worthy of your love. That's essentially what they were doing. And that they, they, those, those people stood there as accusers to accuse this woman. I want to say to you, friend, as a Christian, if we're on the, on the side of accusation, then possibly we're on the wrong side. And so she confronts Jesus and Jesus says, where are you accusing? And they're gone. And then Jesus says two beautiful things to her. He says, where are you accusing? She says, they're gone. She says, and then he says, neither do I condemn you. He forgives her. He sets her free. And then he says, go and sin no more. You know what he's doing in that moment? For some people, we'll go, yeah, that, see Jesus, don't go and sin no more. No, what Jesus was doing is he was redefining her identity. He was saying to, you, to her, you're not a sinner. My love will make you whole. My love will absorb the accusation of the enemy. And it'll change you. It'll forever restore you. It'll make you new. Friend, if you want your life to change, it's not about making more rules for yourself. It's about engaging him as a father. It's about being loved by him, meeting face to face with the happy God who gave everything for you. God's faithful and good and kind. In John 4, there's a woman at the well. And this woman has had five husbands, divorced a lot of them, and currently living with another man. It's not going well. And she meets Jesus at a well. And the Bible says she comes out at an odd time in the day, not in the morning or late in the afternoon when everybody else would come out for water because she's the talk of the town. And like any person, good or bad, what other people say can hurt, right? So she avoids that and she comes out at a different time, but she comes out at the right time because she encounters Jesus. So she's avoiding what people are saying about her, right? <laughs> and she encounters Jesus. She has this encounter with him. It's glorious and amazing. And Jesus is the fullest, glor most glorious representation of, the God, of God's love for us. She encounters him. She has such an encounter. And she goes back to the city, the city that scorns her and mocks her and probably hates her. And she runs back into that city and she says, hey, everybody, you need to come with me. You need to come and meet this guy who told me everything about me. <laughs> Think about that. Here's this woman who's hiding because of who she's become. And she runs back into the city, having encountered love, something so radically changed in her. She goes, I don't care what you think about me. You need to meet Jesus. You need to run into Jesus. This morning, just in closing, I, I was kind of thinking about these things for you guys. And I was thinking, what's going to change you more than anything else is a revelation of his love. It's going to radically change you forever. And what's going to empower you to change the world around you more than anything else is a revelation of his love for others. And we only have that when we encounter his love. What I love about you guys and listening, chatting to Darren, is you guys are a kingdom church. You're not trying to hide in here. You try to invade the world around you. And that's an amazing thing. And you're going to be more, most effective in that place when you are most loved and you are empowered to love. That's what's going to change everything. And I want to encourage you in your pursuit of Jesus. Don't try and pursue him and impress him with being perfect. Was that me? <laughs> Don't try and impress him with doing all the right things. Impress him by opening your heart wide and then inviting him to love you. It's the embrace of the Father. It's the goodness of the Father. And that forever will shape you and change you. Amen? Awesome. I really pray for a revelation for you guys. I've been praying it. You know, a revelation is God's pursuit of us. When you come to, you know what I mean by revelation, hey? It's like, wow, the lights come on. You understand something about God. That's his pursuit of you. And when you pursue him, what he gives you is a, re a greater understanding of him. And I pray that for you today. A greater understanding of how the Father loves you. In spite of you, in spite of all that you've done, he sees more in you. That woman at the well, Jesus picked her as the, the, the evangelist for that city. <laughs> I'm a nice guy, I love Jesus, but I don't know if I would pick her as the evangelist for my time. Jesus saw through five failed marriages. He saw through a wrecked relationship. And he saw in her something so beautiful and so precious. He saw in her the power to transform a city because he knew that she would allow love to shape her. Would you let love shape you 
and you'll transform the city around you. Amen? Cool. I'm going to invite my good buddy Sid up. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to us. Daryl, thank you for having us. Nikki, thank you so much.